So Mark has taken us through several major defining moments in recent chapters. It wasn't that long ago that um, we heard Peter's great confession when Jesus asked the men there at the base of Mount Hermon and Caesarea Philippi, he sort of took them aside and said, now, now, who do people think that I am? And they said, well, some think you're John the Baptist, some Elias, some one of the prophets. And so Jesus asked, well, who, who do you guys think I am? You who've walked with me and, and seen me walk on water and calm the sea and raise the dead and heal people and cast out demons, who do you think I am? And it was Peter who gave that great confession that thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the, the Messiah. And Jesus begins to share the true purpose of his coming. Messiah, yeah, that, that's the right answer. But one who will suffer, not in their mindset, not in their understanding, one who will die, one who will rise from the dead, that there's a, there's a cross in front of me, Jesus would say. It's, it's, it'll happen in Jerusalem. And then after that, the transfiguration, Jesus shining in all his glory. And last week we saw him cast a demon out of a young boy that his disciples were powerless to do anything about. And we pick up our, our story, our, our, our place in the Gospel of Mark here in chapter 9 in verse 30. After casting out the demon, they then departed from there. And they passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know it. Jesus is trying to travel with his men somewhat incognito, if you will. He, he wants some time to, to continue to reveal to them the how of who he is. So he taught his disciples in verse 31, the Son of Man is being betrayed or delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise again on the third day. So now Jesus is beginning to emphasize how he'll be their Messiah. And I'm sure as they, as they walked along the way, and, and they talked about many things, Jesus has this sort of private walking seminar with his men, and he taught them along the road. And can, can you imagine being able to walk through the hillsides of, of Israel down near the Galilee and, and, and just you and 11 other people listening to Jesus talk, teaching you? How amazing would that be? And, and Mark records Jesus once again, d describes, we, we just read it here, how how he who is the Messiah, and they, they, they've said he's the Messiah, but how he'll save them, how he will deliver them, how he'll be their Messiah. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They'll kill him, and also uh, after he's killed, he will rise on the third day. He mentions his, his resurrection even coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration uh, in Mark chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them they should tell no one these things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. A and that he'll be betrayed, he'll be delivered. The, the word actually, the strongest definition is betrayed. And, and I'm sure the reaction to this is, is similar to, to what happened later in the upper room when Jesus said, one of you who, who's here will betray me. And, and they all wondered if it was them. Because I think all of us deep down in our heart know that we have the potential to leave. It's that, that great hymn, perhaps you've heard it, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, here's my heart, Lord, Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Because all of us have that tendency and ability to wander away. 
Maybe that's why in verse 32, as we continue, it says, they did not understand this saying, that he'd be killed, that he'd be betrayed, and that he'd rise on the third day. They did not understand this saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Maybe they didn't want to understand it. A dying Messiah? They didn't want that. A suffering Messiah who will be betrayed? A crucified Christ? Maybe they're afraid to know the whole truth. We don't want to talk about this, Lord. We, want to, we don't want to hear about it. Maybe they're afraid of getting rebuked. Jesus did rebuke his disciples that time for lack of faith. After all they had seen, after all they experienced. But, but one thing I've noticed in Scripture, Jesus never rebuked his disciples, or, or to this day I don't think he does, for asking questions. And perhaps what kept them from asking a question, once again, was not wanting to know the whole story. Have you ever been in that situation? Here's the thing. If you have grown kids... You've been in that situation. You don't want to ask them a lot of questions. So what really happened? I have three grown kids, and to this day, don't tell me. I really don't want to know. Remember when you and mom were gone? That No, I don't want to know what happened when you, don't tell me. My youngest son, we used to have a connect group in our home. We lived down in Navarre. He said, Dad, remember when you had that small group in our house down in Holly by the Sea? I go, yeah. He goes, well, while you guys were meeting, I used to sneak your car out of the garage. <laughs> he, he wasn't old enough to drive. I go, what? What are you talking? Yeah, you guys be in there praying. I was pushing the car out, and cranking it up. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So, so now when he brings stuff like, like that, I'm just, I, I, I don't want to know. I don't want to hear. And maybe it's something like that. Lord, we don't, we don't want to know the whole story. Uh, I think they're very uncomfortable with this whole crucified Messiah thing. This is not what they signed up for, not what they thought they were getting. It's too different, too difficult. There, there's stuff sometimes that, that gets raised that you just don't want to talk about, like a colonoscopy. I, I don't like talking about those. <laughs> Somebody raises that topic. I'd rather not, you know. They're not into the dying Messiah. They're after a conquering king. They're after a mighty leader. They're after greatness in the kingdom. That's what they signed up for. In fact, when they get to Capernaum in verse 33, and when he was in the house, he asked them, Jesus asked, what is it you, you disputed among yourselves on the road? They, they were quiet again. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. Number one, they don't want to hear anything about crucifixion, resurrection, dying Messiah. And all they talked about after Jesus, it seems, maybe went ahead after they wouldn't ask questions, they began to sort of argue about selfish ambition. I mean, everybody struggles with it. I love the story about the two shop owners who were bitter rivals. They had stores across the street from one another and, and, and directly across. They could see every day how many people shopped with them. They would watch each other. They'd keep track of each other's business and cu customers. If one had a better day or week, they would kind of smile and sort of smugly put down the other one. Kind of a condescending way of rubbing it in. You know, how is business? And one night an angel appeared to one of the shopkeepers in a dream. And he said, I'll give you anything you ask. Whatever you receive, however, your competitor will receive twice as much. Would you like to be wealthy? You can be very, very, very rich, but your competitor across the street will be twice as rich. You want to live a long, healthy life? Well, your competitor will be living a life longer and healthier. What's your desire? 
The man frowned and he, and he thought and he contemplated and then he said, here's my request. And they said, okay. Strike me blind in one eye. <laughs> now how bad is that? This thing, I want to be the greatest. And Jesus is not opposed to greatness. Please listen. Please hear this. He just redefines what greatness is for us. Knowing what they had talked about. They kept silent. And he sat down and he called the twelve in verse 35 and said, If anyone desires to be first, are great. He'll be last and, and servant of all. And he, and he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Jesus says, nothing wrong with greatness. You guys just have a, a wrong definition of it. He says greatness is found in serving. You know, I, I think all of us have probably been watching and listening, uh, perhaps not everybody, to, to the crazy tragedy that's going on in uh, the city of the little town of Lahaina in Maui, Hawaii. I have some good friends who live there. In fact, uh, one, of my, one of my friends, Ricky Ryan, pastors a church there in Kumalani and just down the hill from him is Lahaina. So we, we've talked a couple of times on the phone as much as we can. It's body. And um, Ricky was one of, one of the guys that helped mentor me in some ways. And I asked him one time, Ricky, uh, gosh, how do you, you seem to be able to just connect and serve and you do it just amazingly well. He's just a model of serving and loving people. And I love that about him. And I asked him, how did you learn this? He says, well, here's how I learned to serve people. He says, I was a waiter in a really nice upscale restaurant on the water in Maui for four to five years. And he says, you want to learn how to serve? Wait on rich tourists in a nice restaurant. He says, they're not very grateful. He says, but I learned to serve them. I thought, wow, what an amazing thing. The disciples are, are unable to cast out a demon. We saw that last week. He says, because of a lack of, of power in your life through prayerlessness and, and no fasting, and they don't want to know the whole truth about Jesus. And, and now we see this, this pridefulness that rises up them in them as they're arguing over greatness. So he takes the child and puts it in his midst and says, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. That's interesting. You can read different things about this response of Jesus. One writer says, in those days, there's a high mortality rate for children. And they're not treated as, as they were treated today. Yes, there were blessings. The scripture tells us that. But they were kind of the last and the least. Believe it or not, in, in Jesus' day, they didn't have Chuck E. Cheese. There was no Build-A-Bear around the corner. No bouncy houses. And we could go on and on. Children in that day uh, were, were last and least in that culture. He says, you receive care, you, you give help and attention to the least. Serve them. Tr treat all people the same, Jesus is saying. And he had been demonstrating that in his ministry all along the way. If you remember, he, he, he reached out and he, he touched a leper that no one would even come near or around. They, they, in fact, they had pushed him to the outskirts of, they had their own colonies outside of where people had to live. He brought a tax collector into the 12, which I'm sure was uncomfortable for all of them because tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. 
Jesus included people like the Gadarene demoniac. He cast a legion out of him. They had outcast him from the city. He lived among the tombs where he cut himself and wailed all night long. But Jesus healed him, restored him, and sent him out back to his own hometown, almost like one of his first missionaries. And so Jesus says, look, die to yourself. Die to yourself and serve other people. The book of James, and I'll just read this passage to you, says, Brethren, do not hold our, our own the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, Hey, sit in, this is a good place. You sit here. And you say to the poor man, well, well, stand there or sit at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So Jesus says, I, I, I know what you guys were discussing, greatness along the way, who's going to be numero uno. And he says, let me share with you what greatness really is. It's those who serve. He, he, he goes on and, and listen to what he says. Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Now John speaks up in verse 38. Teacher, we, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. We forbade him because he does not follow us. Maybe John's feeling guilty or confused about their standing, their position. Je Jesus, we, we saw some guys having success in ministry. We couldn't cast out demons. That had just happened to them. But we saw someone else doing it in your name, and we stopped them. They weren't Calvary Chapel people. They weren't Baptists. So, so we said, you can't do that. They weren't spirit-filled. Pa part of our thing sometime is we, we become ostracized to, to other people who are genuinely believers because we don't like the way they worship or they have a different slant. Someone wrote this. It's an interesting mantra. Believe as I believe. Now, we're not talking about embracing those who teach heresy or craziness, but believe as I believe, no more, no less. Feel as I feel. Think as I think. Eat what I drink. Drink what I drink. Look as I look. Do always as I do. Then and only then will I have fellowship with you. Hopefully that's not us, right? Hopefully not. Listen to Jesus' response. Do not forbid, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterward speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, as surely I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Jesus says to John's response, don't stop him, John. In fact, you stop what you're doing. Help him. Don't stop him. Certainly not someone who's teaching heresy or, or non-truth. We're, we're not talking about salvation here. We're, we're talking about serving. For he who is not against us is on our side. And the whoever is all-inclusive. Whoever's not against us. You give a cup of water, he or she serves, and in serving Christ, they will never lose their reward. Isn't that amazing? Jesus rewards the smallest and humblest act done to others in his name. The smallest. And I would encourage you as, you, as you walk through your week, as you walk through your day, as you walk through your life, ask the Lord to show you how. 
How can I serve someone today, Lord? How can I stop worrying so much about how I'm seen and see others who need you? Serving others in, in, in the name of the Lord gives you freedom. It takes your eyes off yourself, your need, your group, your thing. And that's what Jesus was constantly showing these men. In, in chapter 10, verse 45 of Mark, there, there's a verse that says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. And if anyone should have been served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus speaks broadly, not just about small children here. He continues with this thing of serving. And he says, whoever causes, verse 42, one of these little ones who believe in me. And there he's not just using the term about children. He's using the term about God's children, about those who believe in him. It doesn't matter if you're 106 or six years old. That's who he's talking about now. Whoever causes one of mine who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If if verse 41 speaks of doing good and serving, it's interesting to me. Then verse 42 is speaking of just the opposite. And, and, and he's adding this idea of pride and self-serving and putting others down. It's a pretty amazing statement that Jesus makes here in verse 42. He, he's, coming against, he's coming against pride. It, 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 listen to this statement again. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it'd be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Does that not sound like Jesus has all of a sudden become a New Jersey mafia guy or something? Hey, you guys, if he causes one to stumble, put a millstone around his neck and throw him in the river. Is this Jesus? He said it'd be better. If you, if you cause one of those who follow me, who's, who's one of my children, to, to fall or stumble, if, if you create that situation. And Jesus gets real, real strong here. He says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. And Jesus talks about hell. He talks about it more than anyone else in the New Testament. Where the worm dies, fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, well, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into fire. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Of course, Jesus is not talking literally here. He's not saying, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're hand and, you know, there'd be a lot of us walking around with one hand if that were the case. Or if your feet or if your eyes. What he's saying is this. He points out things that we place incredible value on. Our hands, what we do. Our eyes, what we can see. Our feet, where we can go, what we see, what we, what we do, where we can go. He says, better to lose those things that you traffic in than to miss heaven. <coughs> so don't do those things, go those places, see those things that would cause people in their faith to stumble. You know, there's a secular attack on the Christian faith in our culture today. That's very stumbling. We see it more and more and more in our government, in our schools, in our entertainment industry. All the things that that have come our way, the culture stumbling children through porn, through alcohol, through drugs, 
Now, now, please don't misunderstand. We are accountable to fight the good fight of faith. That's part of what we're called to do. But God will deal with those who oppose and stumble his people or, 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 or choose to do those things that they know they shouldn't do with their hand or their eye or their feet. And he's extremely strong in this language. And it goes on, not, not just those who stumble the believers, for everyone will be seasoned with fire, verse 49, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if it loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. In other words, it'll all be tested. And in the Old Testament, sacrifices were always accompanied with salt. You can find it in Leviticus and Exodus. And everyone who follows Jesus must become a person of sacrifice. That's what he's saying. And in Romans chapter 12, I don't know if I put this verse up here, but I can. Yeah, I did. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So, so here what he's saying. Let, let me have your attention. There's this call to not to serve, but also to not stumble his children. Today we have... Uh, infatuation in the Christian circles it seems of liberty and freedom and I can do this and I can do that and I can watch this and I can drink that and, and, and no thought many times of how it stumbles other believers especially a new believer who's saying wow you mean you can sleep with your girlfriend or boyfriend before marriage and that's okay well no it's not but, but to a new believer, it could stumble them. Or you can go here, you can do that. No thought of how, no desire to sacrifice self for the cause of Christ. And I, I would call you and I would call me back to that principle. We're called to make sacrifices for Jesus Christ and not to stumble his children. And Jesus is very serious about it. This, this call to be salt and in the ancient world, it was a, uh, you know, a way to preserve food. To, to, and he's talking about being a, a preservative in our culture for, 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 for a way to help stop the decay and the rot and restrain corruption and bring whole new flavor to life. I'm not a big salt person on food, but my wife, she's a saltaholic. We'll be somewhere, and, and, and to me, it's already like salty. And I look over, and Lynn's like, go, what, what are you doing? She goes, it, it, it just it needs salt. And I usually hide it when we're at a restaurant, and I'll stick it behind a thing. She goes, is there no salt here? I go, no, I guess not. I don't. <laughs> but but, but it's, it, what he's saying is it adds flavor to life. That's who we are. To, to cause people to, to become thirsty for Jesus, not, not to misunderstand him or be stumbled by us. There's three things about the salt illustration Jesus uh, could be saying. Live in a way that doesn't stumble others. Be a servant. Be real. Be open and accepting. Don't, don't classify people in, in, in your life by, by their finances or by their abilities or gifts. So don't stumble people. Number two, don't stumble yourself. Cut, cut off those things in your life that, that the Scripture would describe as ungodly living. He says, don't, don't, don't do things you're not supposed to do. He talks about your hands. Don't, don't go where you shouldn't go. He talks about your feet places of disobedience, places of temptation. And, and he says, don't look at things you shouldn't be looking at. And, and, and television, movies, un, ungodly series, so much being forced our way. And finally, he talks about a sacrificial life when he speaks of 
the salt and, and to serve and to give and to live for Jesus, even if it costs you something. And underlying all of this is that call to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says, not only am I your Messiah, you've identified me as that, but I'll also be the one that's betrayed, crucified, and resurrected from the dead. And he's walking along the way with them. He gets there to the, the city of Capernaum. And Jesus just kind of is, is trying to bring his men into an understanding and a reality of what it means to follow him because the cross is very near. We're, we're beginning to enter into that section of Scripture in Mark where almost half of the rest of the book deals with this thing of Jesus becoming the crucified and risen Savior for you and I. And here's the great thing about Jesus. He's alive today. And he speaks to us about our hands and our feet and, and our eyes. And he's, he has risen from the dead. And, and there, there's no misunderstanding now about who he really is. And he calls you and I to follow. He calls you and I to serve. And, and he gives great warning about, about, about stumbling others. And, and, and I think that in the culture that we live in today, there, there's even greater opportunity and greater ability to, to be salt and light in a culture that's becoming so crazy and dark. So, so listen to, to the voice of, of Jesus, not only in your own heart and, in, and from his word, where he, he says to you and I, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last and servant of all. And whoever receives even the, the least in my name receives not me, but him who sent me. And don't forbid others to do things in my name. If they're not against us, they're for us. And Jesus gives us this great call as he, as he closes out, as, as Mark closes out this, this, this chapter Nine that we're called to be salt. And he says, if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? So listen to the voice of Jesus. He says to you, to me, to all of us who claim to be his, don't lose the saltiness, the representation that we've been called to have in this world as salt and light for Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. Jesus is coming back and he's going to reward us for being faithful to him. Do you not think as we walk through this culture and this time frame in our world that things seem to be getting crazier and crazier? I, 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 I can't, I can't, even turn the news on. Oh, there's a fire. There's this. There's a, there's a, a, a hurricane coming up the coast of San, San Diego. Haven't had one in 80 years. Lahaina burned down. Uh, Seattle's in trouble. I mean, it's just like, and then all the moral issues and all that's going on in our culture. And, and I'm thinking, come Lord Jesus. You know, I, I'll close with this stupid story. Um, <laughs> yesterday, my wife and my daughter hosted a shower for my daughter-in-law, and I was in charge of watching three kids at my house, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, and a one-year-old. And we have a pool, and none of them can swim. So I was given a lot of direction before they left. You know, Dad, John, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, I got it, I got it. I got Tootsie Roll Pops, I got donuts, I got, you know, I got the whole thing going on. And so the five-year-old, two days or three days ago, he, for some reason, he's never done this. They all wear floaties. It's like a rule. Uh, he said, I'm going to jump off the diving board. I go, no, you're not. You're not jumping off the diving board. He said, yep, the day's the day. So he just went over there and he jumped off. We were trying to get him to jump off forever. He just... Jumped in. Just like, Whoa. So his four-year-old brother goes over there and says, I'm going to jump off too. He gets there and he goes. 
he won't do it. He won't jump off. So we tried not to shame him too much. So yesterday, he said, I'll jump off when I'm five. He's only four. Well, I get it. So yesterday, we're in the water, just me and him and the other, no one's there but us and the one-year-old. And um, so I said, so read today's the day, right? You're jumping. He goes, no, I'm jumping when I'm five. I go, well, what would it take to get you to jump off that diving board? So what, what kind of, I said, I've got some money. <laughs> what would it take? And he, he, he just stood there for a minute. He goes, a new Hot Wheels. <laughs> That's it? I go, you got it, go. He got out of the pool, walked up to the dive board, took four steps and jumped off. <laughs> and I'm like, you're the man. <laughs> Fist bump, high five. And of course, Grant, what about me? I jumped off. The, yeah, but you're five. <laughs> so last thing we did yesterday, we were in Walmart with all three of them. All three of them got, uh, uh, but I say this, God rewards. He may not, you may not get a Hot Wheels. You don't want Hot Wheels. You want heaven, right? And that's what he says I'll reward you with. I'll reward you with heaven. He may not get everything we want on this, this earth, but one thing he's called us to do is to, to be careful what we do with our lives, with our hands, where we go with our feet and what we see with our eyes. These are Jesus' words. And he says, please be salt in this world because if the salt loses its flavor, how will it get it back? And it seems like in so many ways the influence of the, of the church of Jesus Christ is being, is being harassed and, and losing its saltiness in so many areas in our world. So my call to myself and to you is let's be salt for Jesus Christ.